First at Five. From the University of Florida's College of Journalism and Communications, you're watching WUFT News. Welcome to WFT News First at Five. I'm Francis Capper. And I'm Rafael de los Santos. Thanks for joining us. The city of Gainesville is wrestling with the issue of people drinking outside of downtown bars and on sidewalks and streets. Commissioners eased the open bar container during the pandemic and are now working to rewrite the rules for next year. WFT's Jake Lynch attended the, today's commission meeting and now joins us with more. Jake, tell us about the options. One idea taking shape is to have a general ban on open containers, except for a designated zone downtown where you could take your last drink outside a bar and finish on the streets. On one hand, commissioners are hearing public safety concerns about late night drinking leading to violence. And on the other hand, they're hearing from a number of businesses that don't want a total ban on outdoor drinking. If the city commission votes to repeal the open container policy, drinks like these will no longer be allowed to be carried in public. Danny Hughes and other bar owners in the downtown area feel that this law could harm their businesses. I believe that most people that use and utilize downtown most effectively want to keep this and we, they want this privilege that we've earned. The three bars that have been the most vocal about keeping the law the same are Lucy's, How Bazaar, and The Bull. Commissioners are voting on whether the city will continue to allow drinking in public, a law that has been suspended to help businesses out during COVID restrictions. This comes after feelings of worry from the community regarding public safety. Gainesville Police Chief Lonnie Scott has said he supports the measure to limit drinking in the city, citing the violence his department faces at large night gatherings with alcohol present. While some business owners are concerned about how this will affect their customers, Others at City Hall are worried about how this will impact public health and safety. This includes previous bar owners alike. Businesses thrive when cities are safe. So this is not um, about hurting businesses, it's about helping them. It's a hot button issue with dozens of city residents speaking on either side. The city may now tweak the pair of proposed ordinances before revisiting them next month. Two big topics right now in Florida, the heat and the tropics. Nothing new there, it's just another day in the Sunshine State. And so to find out how it will all shape up, let's join WFT's Selena Massman with the weather forecast. Thanks guys. Yes, the heat is incredibly uncomfortable right now. We are seeing heat indexes almost in the triple digits, Ocala even breaking that th triple digit threshold. Gainesville and Stark almost breaking that triple digit threshold. The actual temperatures fortunately are a little bit lower, but that does not make it any more comfortable outside. We're seeing Gainesville at 93, Stark at 88, and Jacksonville at 82. Taking a look outside at current conditions, we see a bright blue sky with some very nice clouds and sunny skies expected for the next hour, but do expect to see some rain showers coming in tonight. So make sure that your dinner plans are weatherproof. Back to you guys. Thank you, Selena. Hurricane Idalia hit two weeks ago, but some are still reeling from the effects. The Farmers Bureau is making it its mission to help the farmers and ranchers affected. WFT reporter Caitlin Schiffer spent the day on the farm, checking out the damage left behind. Farming runs through Timothy Driver's DNA. On his property in Mayo, he cultivates livestock and tobacco. But even two weeks after Hurricane Idalia, it's been a struggle for Driver to get back on his feet. It's devastation. I don't believe I'll ever, I will never see the end of it as long as I live. And I don't know if my kids ever, you know, they may never see the end of it either because these trees is never going to be the same. And it's just, everything's demolished. Adalia tore through Driver's 400 acre property, resulting in over $150,000 worth of damages. We've never been hit with nothing like this in this area. You know, we've had them close and had some winds, but nothing like this. It's just, I think everybody's still in shock and people want to give up, but you know, you can't do it. You got to keep going and fighting for life, but um, it's, it's bad for everyone. Idalia is the first hurricane to hit the north central Florida region this season. Farmers such as Timothy Driver have been devastated by the impacts of Hurricane Idalia. As you can see Driver shed behind me, the roofing has imploded, tools are everywhere, his farmland is completely destroyed. 
The Florida Farm Bureau has been assisting and helping these farmers in a time of need. The Florida Farm Bureau is holding a supply drive and set up a hurricane disaster relief fund to help these farmers. There are a lot of producers and <clears throat> farmers we're involved in the, the enhancement of technologies and the capability to, to produce more food with less, uh, less fertilizer, less water, less acreage as we see those acreages diminish. So our producers are involved in, and the Farm Bureau is helpful in being able to make sure that those efficiencies are maximized. Although these farmers face many challenges on the road ahead, they will do it together as a community. Caitlin Schiffer, WUFT News. To donate to farmers and ranchers affected by the hurricane, you can visit FloridaFarmBureau.org. A shark bit a 38-year-old man from South Carolina while he was surfing in New Smyrna Beach this morning. The video shows several sharks and surfers in the water. The surfer was taken to the hospital and later released. A witness says the man had a bite on his cheek after riding a wave and falling in the shallow water. Longtime surfers say that often spooks the sharks and it's a reaction bite. Typically, shark bites in Volusia County are not life-threatening and there haven't been any fatalities as far back as anyone can remember. Tuesday's bite is the seventh shark bite in Volusia County so far this year. The Dixie County Sheriff's Office shared Cross City Police Department's Facebook post about a series of multi-county vehicle thefts to businesses believed to be connected to the same individual. The stolen vehicles are used as transportation to burglarize businesses in other counties, including Gilcrest, Levy, Columbia, and Citrus. It appears the suspects dump the stolen vehicles in those counties and then steals another car to drive back to Cross City. The police department developed a person of interest but has not made contact with that individual yet. Early voting began in Ocala for the City Council District 2 seat today. Our Bethay Sr. and Reginald E. Landers Jr. are competing for the seat. This is not the first time they have competed for a City Council seat. There are 16 City of Ocala voting locations. Here are a few. First Christian Church, Mary Sue Ridge Community Center, Riley Arts Center, Central Christian Church, and Four Ranch Prairie Club. 35 Alachua County public school students are being recognized by the College Board as National Merit semifinalists. This places them among 1% of high school seniors nationally. Three of the National Merit semifinalists earned the highest possible score on the exam. You can see them on the screen. Megan Chen, Daniel Wang, and Nathan Wei from Beholds High School. Congratulations. Coming up on WFT's First at Five, the latest on the flooding situation in Libya. Plus, we'll tell you about the search efforts in Morocco. Please stay with us. You're watching WUFT TV News. The Libyan city of Derna is almost washed off the map due to heavy rainfall and flooding from Storm Daniel this week. This drone video shows just how extensive the damage is. The death toll has surpassed 6,000, and that number is expected to rise. Entire neighborhoods were washed out into the sea. More than 30,000 people have been displaced by the flooding. An earthquake struck Morocco just days ago. As search operations continue, people in this region are not only grieving over their lost loved ones, but they're also dealing with practical challenges ahead. NBC's Raf Sanchez reports from Marrakesh. Nearly a week after the 6.8 magnitude earthquake that rocked this country, what started as a massive rescue operation has now largely transitioned to recovery. Search teams are still fanned out throughout the disaster zone in the high Atlas Mountains, but at this point, there is very little hope of finding more survivors. The death toll is hovering at about 3,000 at this point, and many of those who lost their lives are still buried underneath the rubble of what were their homes. Search teams we speak to say they are determined to do everything they can to try to recover the bodies and get them back to their families for dignified burials. But Morocco is facing many, many challenges beyond the initial disaster. One is finding shelter for the tens of thousands of people who have lost their homes. Many of them are now living in tents, but we have been to communities where people are living in makeshift shelters using tarp and wood to do anything they can to shield their families from the mountain winds. Morocco is a country where tourism is a major, major part of the economy. A number of major tourist hotels up in the mountains have been badly damaged, and it is not clear that international visitors will be flooding back to this country anytime soon. This is an industry that a lot of local people depend on, and it is one of the many questions facing this country as it tries to recover from the earthquake. 
Raf Sanchez, NBC News, Marrakesh. Five Florida colleges joined the ranks amongst the schools with the best free speech culture and climate in the country. The Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression surveyed two, 248 colleges across the country. The organization known as FIRE ranks schools based on 13 components. Those range from students' perception of free speech to administrative policies. Florida State University is ranked the highest in the state at number five. The University of South Florida placed 12th in the country. Florida International University has taken place for number 46. And the University of Florida ranks number 231. The University of Florida School of Music will receive $35 million for repairs in the new budget. The former director filed a petition demanding the university respond to numerous problems. One problem, exposure to humidity, can damage instruments. The current director of the School of Music tells us that they plan to add a major addition to the building with the resources. U of Health and Flagler Health officially merged yesterday. The St. John's County-based Flagler Health officially became part of U of Health's academic health system on September 1st. The hospital will now be named UF Health Flagler Hospital. We're a week away from fall. But the heat is still on. WFT forecaster Selena Massman will bring us the details when we come back. You're watching WUFT TV News. Taking a look at the tropics, fortunately, Florida is not in the headlines this week with any hurricane coming our way. However, the Lee is still a topic of discussion. We have gotten this new video from Hurricane Hunters just a couple days ago showing us the eye of Hurricane Lee, which is calmed down a lot since its Category 5 uh, form last week, and now to a Category 1. That does not make this storm any less large. It is still a massive storm. If it hit Florida, we would be looking at it covering the entire state. So we are very lucky to not have to deal with this storm. We are not in the cone for Hurricane Lee from the National Hurricane Center. The only effects we could be seeing from the storm are high waves along the east coast of the state if you plan on going to the weekend, over the weekend to the beaches there. If you have any friends or family living up here in, near Maine or Nova Scotia, might want to give them a call and let them know that the tro uh, tropical cyclone is coming their way. Give them some advice on what to expect. Feeling the heat, looking at some more local temperatures, Currently, we're looking at 88 degrees going into the mid-70s throughout the night. We see an increased chance for rain around 7 p.m., so make sure that your dinner plans are weatherproof. Looking into tomorrow, the weather is similar to today, highs in the upper 80s and also in the lower 90s. Do prepare for some rain chances tomorrow as we will be seeing a lot of rain during the afternoon hours, lunchtime, 4 p.m., but also moving into late evening dinner time. So if you are going out to the UF soccer game tomorrow night, make sure you bring an umbrella. Looking at Saturday for our big game day, make sure that you also bring an umbrella, unfortunately, because we do see a cloudy chance earlier in the day while tailgating, hopefully making it a little bit nicer standing outside. But the showers make it difficult to make it difficult to enjoy the game as much as we used to like to. Muggy meter shows how uncomfortable it is, and the six-day forecast shows high of 80 throughout the week with rain chances throughout the week, rest of the week. Back to you guys. There's a big mashup in town this weekend. That's right. The Gators football team will take on the Tennessee Volunteers. That's not the only one coming to town. The Gators volleyball team takes on number one Wisconsin at home Sunday. We'll tell you what head coach Mary Wise says the Gators need to do to pull off the upset. All that and more in sports coming up next. You're watching WUFT TV News. Welcome to sports. I'm Reagan Shepard. Gator volleyball once again showed that victory is the only goal in sight. After a tough match defeating the Seminoles in five sets, the Gators are back home preparing for one of their biggest matchups in history. As the team sets up to host number one Wisconsin, head coach Mary Weiss says her littles, those back row defenders, will be key to a Gator upset. Their numbers may not show up in this uh, box score like uh, front row players, but they've been a key. And um, Wisconsin's like, they're going to hit over us, and there'll be times where it's going to take in a great effort and hopefully we can keep the ball from hitting the floor. 
The Gators take on the Badgers on Sunday at 3 p.m. in the O-Dome. Sold out home games are no stranger to Gators football, but the dedication of fans is forever present. Gator coach Billy Napier says it is a motivating force for him and his team. You know, it's not, it's not a topic of conversation at the University of Florida. We have, talking about loyal, right? we have loyal fans, we have passionate fans, and um, ultimately it's a motivator for me. The Gators face off against the Volunteers on Saturday in the Swamp at 7 p.m. That's it for sports. I'm Reagan Shepard. Thank you, Reagan. Princess Diana's 1981 black and red sheep sweater was sold at an auction in New York for $1.1 million. This is a new auction record for any piece of clothing worn by the late princess. It depicts a lone sheep among rows of white sheep. Diana first wore the red sweater to watch then Prince Charles play in a polo game in June 1981. Before we go, one last check on the weather. Thank you guys. Yes, the weather for the six day outlook, we're keeping it pretty similar to what we're expecting. Highs in the mid 80s, lows in the low 70s, even reaching to 69 on Wednesday. The rain chances are still the same as of right now. We're not really seeing fall Florida temperatures just quite yet, even though the fall season starts up in 10 days. Thanks, Alina. BBC World News is next, and the PBS News Hour is coming up at 7. Your Florida news is always online at wuft.org. Have a good night.